So I would like to welcome all of you uh, to our second colloquium. Case was telling me to tell you now the colloquia are online, so basically you can check them out online from last week. And Natalie's will be online in a couple of days. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Natalie Pataya, who is the mission scientist for NASA's Kepler mission. And as you see already from her title, she'll give us an insight on some of the amazing finds that that mission has done. And I kind of promised her, and she's going to hit me for that, to just say Natalie is, well, a mission scientist for Kepler and amazing, and leave it at that so she can actually give her talk. Thank you. so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, um, even with this nice weather. Um, thank you for coming out. I know it must be difficult to get yourselves all bundled up and come to a late afternoon for you, but I appreciate your presence. Um, I'm here to tell you about NASA's Kepler mission. Um, I'm going to assume in a room full of astronomers that everybody's heard of Kepler, correct? <laughs> okay. um, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the mission. Was anybody here at the IAU in Beijing? A couple. Oh, all right. Very good. Um, so the title of this talk is Finding the Next Earth, because NASA is on a mission to find another Earth, Earth 2.0. And I'll actually go a step farther and say with great certainty, because I heard a colleague of a colleague of a colleague tell me this, um, that NASA is on a mission to find life in the galaxy. And I've heard uh, in a, this roundabout way NASA administrators stating this quite clearly. And I think we all feel that that's really within our grasp. I myself feel like this is within our grasp maybe within the next hundred years, let's say. You know, I think tangibly about my grandchildren um, having that information. So it's, it's not pie in the sky, it's not science fiction anymore. And Kepler is one step towards that ultimate goal. So let me back up and uh, show you an XKCD cartoon. <laughs> XKCD, we, we know and love, and this was a cartoon that they did uh, maybe a couple of months ago. Um, so it's just a cartoon of balls, all of them representing one of the confirmed planets, exoplanets that we know of to date. And that number, as you can see, is pushing up against 1,000. So the scene is quite different than it was in 1995 when I was a graduate student in Florence listening to Michelle Mayor announce the discovery of 51 Peg. We've come a long way. But, but look at this cartoon. You can see quite clearly. The reason I like to show it is because pictorially, you can see that most of these confirmed planets are larger than Jupiter. How can you tell that? Because in the middle of this diagram, you might not have even noticed, is a tiny rectangular box containing a few circles, um, shaded gray there in the middle, and the words underneath it say, this is our solar system. And the two biggest balls there are Jupiter and Saturn. So scan your eye over this cartoon and you see that the majority of these planets are bigger than Jupiter. Right? Okay. Uh, but maybe it's just a trick of, uh, maybe it's an illusion because the tiny dots, you know, we're, we've got some bias there because the big dots are easier to see. Um, so what I will show you now is another cartoon, the uh, exoplanet periodic table done by our friends at the uh, Planetary Habitability Lab in Puerto Rico. And so what we've got here is a layout of um, size and equilibrium temperature based on where the planet is orbiting. And this is for the population of confirmed planets. Um, so we've got the larger planets on the right, and we've got the cooler planets, smaller equilibrium temperatures or incident flux at the bottom. And so you can see that the square that has the highest population is way up there in the right-hand corner, right? Uh, hot Jupiter's, right? Okay. 
So, Kepler. Kepler enters the scene, and Kepler is funded by NASA to do one very specific thing, and that is to find the fraction of stars in our galaxy that harbor Earth-sized planets that are potentially habitable, or in the purported habitable zone. So it's a population study, it's a statistical study, it is not a mission about characterizing a lot of planets or understanding the details of their properties. Uh, Kepler measures size. So it is a space-based telescope, and the way that it finds planets is via the transit method. Um, let's see, I guess here in Europe you had to be up in the middle of the night in order to see this event, maybe last June, right? This was the transit of Venus across the surface of the sun. Uh, we, in, on the uh, west coast of the United States, got to see it nicely about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. It was quite lovely. Um, the idea is that every rock suspended in a sunbeam is casting a shadow out into the galaxy. Right? Our own Earth is casting a shadow out into the galaxy. And so we're going to make use of these coincidences and observe a large number of stars in the hopes that some percentage of them will have the right geometry so that their shadows will sweep across the face of our telescope. Okay? Eclipsing. Right? And we're going to do this with a very sensitive camera because the, the change in brightness from a, a planet as small as an Earth is going to be about one part per 10,000. So we need part per million precision to do this. So we need a very sensitive photometer aboard a very stable spacecraft uh, that we can control very well. We want the starlight to fall on a pixel and, and be on that pixel for the duration. Um, so we do this with a large field of view camera uh, feeding light to about a one meter aperture telescope. There on the right hand side you see the mosaic of CCD detectors. There are 42 of them in all. Um, that image is about 100 square degrees on the sky, so about the size of the hand, right? Which is very large in, in astronomical standards. It's a heliocentric orbit, it's not orbiting the Earth, and this has been a great plus for us. It gives us a lot of stability, a very stable temperature environment, uh, and that's really been a boon for high precision photometry. The other thing that we need is a lot of stars, right? Because the probability of having this chance alignment uh, for an Earth-Sun analog is about a half of 1%. So we need to observe many stars in order to find these uh, chance alignments. And so the mission is designed to observe 170,000 stars simultaneously, and hence the big field of view. And here it is projected onto the sky. Uh, the full moon would fit inside one of the gaps between the CCDs. So it's a very large field of view here in the summer constellation uh, just between Cygnus and Lyra. Now, there are four and a half million stars in our galaxy alone in that one footprint on the sky. So we spent four years before the mission even was launched characterizing those stars with multicolor broad and medium band photometry. Because we, we don't want to observe all four and a half million. Most of those stars are going to be distant, luminous giants. We're not going to be able to see a transit signal due to an Earth-sized planet around a giant star. The dimming of light is even significantly smaller than one part per 10,000. Uh, so we took four years, we characterized about one and a half million stars, the brightest ones in the field of view, and cherry-picked the ones that would yield the most science with regards to the detection of Earth-sized planets. And so here is an observer's HR diagram. Uh, the axes are surface gravity versus effective temperature instead of what you're normally used to seeing for an HR diagram. That's because these are the observables that we get out of spectroscopy or even multicolor photometry. Um, so the white lines are the evolutionary tracks that are mapped to this parameter space, surface gravity and effective temperature. So I'm just going to turn on lights. Uh, so what you see on this diagram is that of these 170,000 stars, that's much better, thank you, that we're observing, the large majority of them, over 80% of them, are kind of G-type mid-sequence stars, where that cluster of red is on the bottom. 
However, we do have about 10,000 giant stars that we're also observing for various other purposes. Okay, so that's my very short introduction um, about the instrument and what it is we're trying to do. For the remainder of the talk, I'd like to first talk about um, what I've called the planet candidates. So this is the catalog of everything interesting that Kepler has found that is consistent with the planet interpretation. Okay? So all of the periodic transit events or eclipses that we find in the data we've cataloged, if they are consistent with the planet interpretation, um, and that's what I mean by planet candidates. However, we have also confirmed, validated, characterized a subsample of those planet candidates, and that's the second part of the talk. Uh, the planet confirmations. And then just to end by looking forward, because after all, we've only, at this moment in time, we've only analyzed about half of the data. So our most interesting results are still yet to come. We'll have to invite one of us back here in a couple of years. <laughs> all right, so first the planet candidates. Um, we always like to show uh, the results, just give you kind of the bird's eye view of what Kepler has done by showing a scatter plot of, of radius of the planet versus orbital period, because these are the things that we measure. I, I like to plot the observables. We measure transit depth. The amount of dimming of light is directly related to the size of the occulting disk, the planet, compared to the star, of course, so you need to know something about the star, too. Uh, versus orbital period, which is just simply the timing between transit events, okay? And so the white dots that you see here were the transiting planets that were known uh, just before Kepler launched, okay? Uh, there are some small ones you see hovering around Neptune, uh, pushing down towards small sizes. Pluto was uh, flying and finding some of these things. But the large majority of the transiting planets pre-Kepler were clustered there at Jupiter sizes and orbital periods of about three days. Not surprising, right? You saw the exoplanet periodic table. That's where everything clustered. And the same was true for transiting planets. Since Kepler launched, we have released three catalogs of all of these transit-like events that we see in the data. One in 2010, one in 2011, and one at the beginning of this year, 2012. And so I will show you sequentially the points that get added to these diagrams as we go from 2010 to 2012. So before Kepler, we had about 89 of these objects. Not about, there were exactly 89. Um, here's 2010. Already, you see that the statistics are very different. No longer do they cluster at Jupiter sizes in short orbital periods, right? Uh, over 80% of these are smaller than Neptune. So that's 2010, there were 300, 2011, 2012. So we now have 2,300, over 2,300 transit sequences in our data associated with 1,790 stars, which means many of these are associated with the same star, multiple systems, right? Um, as you go from 2010 to 2011 to 2012, you see the blue, you go from the blue to the red to the yellow, the parameter space is broadening. Um, and more specifically, we see uh, the project is working towards smaller sizes at longer orbital periods, which is exactly what you would expect simply by way of collecting more data. You know, you're, you're beating down your noise, you're observing for longer, so you're detecting transits at longer orbital periods. Um, again, uh, the large majority, over 80% of these, are smaller than Neptune. Um, and in fact, the, uh, well, I'll show you. Let's go back to our exoplanet periodic table. They've done a similar thing for the Kepler candidates. And here's what it looks like. And so you can see quite clearly the longer is the most populated box, the one in the top right corner, right? The most populated box are the super-Earths which they're defining to be 1.25 to 2.6 Earth radii. Uh, but we still have observational biases, right? We haven't yet converted this to, to, to statistics. I'll, I'll show that in a minute. 
uh, there are observational biases here, sensitivity, the fact that we are sensitive to the shorter orbital periods. Uh, only later will we get the most interesting planet candidates. Um, other biases have to do with the probability, right? Uh, longer period planets have a smaller probability of being detected just by way of the geometrical alignment. You know, the further away you get from the star, the smaller angle is required to sweep that right out of the transit geometry, right? So the, the probability is inversely related to the distance between the planet and the parent star. So we expect the numbers to dwindle down, right? As we work towards this bottom right-hand corner, the number of points will peter out because of that probability argument and because of sensitivity. Um, however, we are working our way towards that bottom right hand. If I, if I uh, change the x-axis instead of orbital period, I do it as a function of equilibrium temperature. You assume some kind of Earth-like albedo uh, for the planet, and you calculate based on the instant flux that you receive from that particular star, its radius and temperature. Uh, what would the uh, this idea of an equilibrium temperature be? And this green region is more or less where we consider the habitable zone to be. That's a very generous definition of the habitable zone. Uh, but it gives you some idea of how many are falling in that area. And more importantly, it shows you this Earth locus. Here is Earth at its equilibrium, the similar idea of an equilibrium temperature and size. And you can see that these points are just beginning to hover uh, around that locus. Uh, the same group, the Planetary Habitability Laboratory, likes to track which objects are in the habitable zone that happen to be small also. And so these, I believe, are smaller than 2.6 Earth radius, so the super Terrans and, and smaller. Um, Color-coded to show you those that are at the inner edge of the habitable zone, which are red, those that are at the outer edge, which are blue. The solar system planets are up there on the right for comparison. So that green ball is Earth, and if you just scan through the, the Kepler planet candidates uh, for habitability, the one that has the closest size is 2124 over there. Um, and if you consider both size and temperature, it looks like it's 1686. I'll just show you some data. This is the light curve of 2124. So these are, this is the actual data. Every black point is a, is a brightness measurement. Uh, it's phase folded. So you, you fold it at the orbital period and stack them in minimum. The blue points with their associated error bars are bend fluxes. And so you can see this has a very high SNR uh, transit detection. And in fact, this SNR is scaling as the square root of the number of observations or the baseline, the time. Um, so this is a very nice, robust signal. And all of our vetting statistics say that this is real uh, around a star that's about 4,100 Kelvin. I mentioned something about the multiples. Remember, 2,300 planet candidates associated with about 1,750 stars. Um, this is the same plot that you just saw, but it's color-coded a little bit differently. Uh, the stars that harbor only one planet are colored white. The stars that harbor two are colored yellow. The stars that harbor three are green, four blue, five and six are red. So if you stare at this for a little while, you notice a couple of things. Well, first of all, the, the fraction of stars that harbor multiply transiting planet candidates, multiple candidates, is about 20%, which is consistent with the radial velocity surveys. They're finding a similar number. Um, but the other thing that you notice here is that there are no colored points in the upper left-hand part of the diagram. That's where the hot Jupiters are, right? That's exactly the cluster where, where the uh, pre-Kepler transiting planets were located, right? And there are no colored points up there. So the, the people who have been spending years looking at these hot Jupiter systems, hoping to find other planet candidates, other planets in those systems, um, are probably not going to find anything. And there's probably a dynamical reason for that. 
right? Whatever mechanism it was that led to a short period Jovian sized planet is also kicking everything out of the system, right? I, I don't know exactly what mechanism that is, but this is telling us something uh, about that dynamic. So if I take these multis and I straighten them out, each horizontal line is one system. And they're strung out by orbital period on the x-axis, and they're sorted vertically by the orbital period of the innermost planet, from inner to outer. Um, you can see, just by staring at this, you start to notice patterns, right? Uh, and, and so the point is that with these sheer numbers, this only represents a third of the multi-systems that we've got so far. Not only can you learn about the statistics of, of planets out in the galaxy, the fraction of stars that host planets of certain sizes, uh, not only can you go and confirm these things and learn something about the properties of individual planets, you can also study architectures, how entire systems are put together, and understand that dynamics, those dynamics. I'm going to skip ahead on the side. Um, so why do we call them planet candidates? Why don't we just call them planets? So the big question is, what fraction of these things are real? Right? And so I thought I'd show this cartoon just to illustrate what some of the common false positives are, the posers. These are the astrophysical signals in nature that mimic planet transits. Right? Um, and by far the most common uh, is the one on the right. On the left here, I've got a scenario where I've got two stars, and, and a binary system, that are eclipsing one another, but in a geometry such that they are just grazing. That one star just kisses the lower limb of that other star as it, as it orbits, right? And therefore, the amount of dimming of light is going to be very tiny. Uh, and maybe look like a planet transit. And in fact, they don't. They don't look like a planet transit. And that's not a very common false positive scenario for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is because the shape, the ingress and egress, the shape of the transit itself is quite different. It's going to be kind of V-shaped, as opposed to a very square-bottomed transit that normally occurs when you have a very high radius ratio and radius contrast. The second reason why we really aren't bothered by these things is because you would also have an associated secondary eclipse in many cases when you have circular orbits. And we have such high precision photometry that we can detect the secondaries and see that they have slightly different depths, which is indicative of an eclipsing binary geometry, not a planet transit. So the left-hand side doesn't bother us too much. By far, the most common false positive scenario is what we call the background eclipser. The pixels on a Kepler CCD are four arc seconds across. They're large pixels. So near the galactic plane, you've got a large number of stars, right? We wanted a large number of stars. We purposely pointed the telescope somewhat near to the galactic plane. But that means in a four arc second pixel, or in maybe a uh, three by three pixel aperture, you're going to have a large, relatively large number of stars. And you're not going to be able to resolve them necessarily when they're in the same pixel, in that same four arc seconds. And so you can have a geometry or a situation where you've got some distant star that is an eclipsing binary that happens to be lined up with the target star that you're actually observing. And you're just collecting the light from that total system. And so that background eclipsing binary is contributing a small percentage of light to the photometric aperture. And that small percentage of light is going to cause a small percentage change of brightness which could mimic a planet transit again, right? Um, so this is by, by far our most common false positive, but for the same reasons that I mentioned over here on the left-hand side, a large number of these things we can rule out. Um, and there's 
also another way that we can hold them out, not just by detecting primary and secondary eclipses, but by reverting it back to the actual pixel data. Not the flux time series, but the actual pixel data. So here I've got an example of various photometric apertures. On the upper left-hand side, I have an average, a stacked average, of photometric apertures that were taken while the object is transiting. On the right-hand side, the same, but while the object was out of transit. Okay? And if you just look at the top two, they look identical. Right? On that color mapping. Ah, but if you subtract them, you get this in the bottom left hand corner. Okay? Now, the target star position, it's this 12th magnitude star right here, which is the triangle here, which is the triangle here. So you can see that the majority of the energy in that transit is not associated with the target star at all. It's up here, associated with this black circle, which happens to be this 16th magnitude background star. So this is a background eclipse in binary. It's exactly one of those that I mentioned, one of those scenarios. Um, so we can eliminate most of these scenarios with the pixel data. The only case, and, and this is afforded us because we have such good pointing stability. We can measure the photo center distribution, the center of light distribution on those pixels with a precision of 10 to the minus five pixels. So that allows us to rule out background eclipsing binaries, other stars that are more than a half a pixel away. Right? So we're only left with the background with the false positive scenarios where you have one of these background eclipsers uh, right smack on the pixel of the target star itself. And that doesn't happen very often. All right? So people have done numerical simulations to find out how often is that going to happen. And it turns out it's going to be something like 15%. 15% of our candidates are probably some other astrophysical signal. But when you have 2,300 of them, you live with 15%, right? Okay, so we make bias corrections. We take out this... Um, analytic function that expresses the probability of the transit geometry as a function of distance. We can correct for that analytically. Uh, we ask ourselves the question, okay, um, is it true of all these 150,000 stars that we're observing, is it true that I could have detect detected a planet as small as one Earth radius? And the answer is no. We've only analyzed one, 16 months worth of data, one year and four months worth of data. So no, we don't have the SNR yet to detect an Earth-sized planet in every single one of our stars. So if you do that, we take out that kind of a, like a long was biased, if you will, uh, from the data as well. And we make those corrections and then we come up with a, an actual distribution of the occurrence rates. And this was done. Uh, by Andrew Howard and collaborators based on the uh, 2011 data set and then updated but unpublished for the 2012 data set. Um, and so this is what it looks like for the 2012 data set as a function of planet radius. So on the y-axis we have the number of planets per star, four systems that have orbital periods less than 50 days, um, as a function of planet radius. And so if you start over here on the right-hand side, where you have uh, Jupiter's over here at about 13, uh, this down here would be kind of Neptune, around 4, someplace in between, you've got 1% of stars having planets in that size range. Uh, if you go down to Neptune sizes, it increases by an order of magnitude. Right? Now it's up at almost 10%. Uh, I'm sorry, 10% up here at 2 to 2.8. Um, so it seems to be rising like a power law. But then the big question is what does it do below 2 Earth radii? And so we purposely colored this orange and put a big question mark here simply to say that we do not believe these points. Even though we have error bars attached to them, 
the errors are not just due to Poisson statistics. These errors are going to be dominated by completeness, issues of completeness. We do not believe in this sample that our software pipeline would have found every single transiting signal in the data that has the requisite signal to noise ratio. Uh, so we, we, we call that pipeline incompleteness. Um, there's a paper that's a, going to come out maybe the beginning of next year that everybody should look for. It's a paper by Francois Frassin, uh, who's at CFA, who has updated these statistics simultaneously solving for the pipeline incompleteness and the reliability rate of the catalog. Um, and so you're going to see the advised numbers sometime early next year. Um, so you have that to look forward to. Um, all, right. all right. I think that's about all I'm going to say about the statistics. Uh, like I said, you'll have to invite me back in a couple of years uh, to give you the update, the final numbers. Um, but the bottom line is we have right now in our catalog 250 Earth-sized planets, uh, but we don't have a lot of inhabitable zone. So this is integrated over all four periods. What we really want to do in the future is to do a two-dimensional histogram, both for, orbital, uh, both for radius and for orbital period, because we don't want just to know the fraction of stars that have Earth-sized planets. We want to know the fraction of stars that have Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone. And we don't have the statistics yet, the numbers, um, to say that that's going to be. Okay. <laughs> All right, so in the next part of the talk, I want to just talk about some of the more interesting planet confirmations. I mean, we do want to see these places, not just the statistics, we want to see them as actual worlds, right? We want, we want destinations, not just dots on a scatter plot. Um, so, uh, of the 2,300 planet candidates that we have, at this moment in time we have, well it says in the bottom right hand corner, 78 uh, planet confirmations and characterizations, and actually that number is now out of date because there's another paper that was just recently accepted that has, uh, well two papers actually, and collectively they are confirming 40 new planet candidates. So we now have over 100 planet confirmations, and that might seem like a small percentage of the 2,300, but I'm sure I don't need to tell anybody in this audience the, uh, the amount of time and patience that is required to actually pin down the masses of a planet, either with Doppler measurements or, or some other techniques which I'll tell you about. So it is a very uh, expensive endeavor to characterize these planets. Um, but of course, that's exactly what we want to see happen. Right? We want all of these things to be characterized. Um, so here what I'm showing, here is that footprint of the CCDs again projected onto the sky. Uh, you can see the wing of Cygnus the Swan here on the left. Uh, it doesn't look much like a wing, but it is. And then the, the location of the planet candidates on the field. This is another cartoon um, just showing the relative sizes of some of the planet confirmations, most of them, but not all of them. And I'm just showing it again to emphasize that the majority of the planets that we are finding are smaller than, than Jupiter, uh, but also the, the majority of the planets that we are confirming and characterizing are not only smaller than Jupiter, they're smaller than Neptune. And that's no coincidence. That's where we're putting all of our resources. Right? Well, we, we can't afford to devote resources to confirming hot Jupiters anymore, right? We want to know something more. We want to learn something more about the most interesting systems. And so let me start right in with um, the, the Kepler poster children. Um, here's that diagram that I showed you already, and I'd love to tell you about Kepler 10, 20, and 22. These are the stars of, uh, not the uh, literal stars, but the... Uh, figurative stars of Kepler. Um, first is Kepler-20. The Kepler-20 system has five planets associated with it, B, C, D, E, and F. And here you're seeing E and F. The two outermost planets um, are 
earth size, one slightly smaller at 0.87 radii and one slightly larger, about 3% larger. Uh, but they orbit Kepler 20, the star itself, at relatively short orbital periods, uh, six, about 6 and 20 day orbital periods, giving equilibrium temperatures of like 700 to 1000 degrees Kelvin. So these planets are not in the habitable zone. However, they were a, an important milestone for us because they were the confirmations of the first truly Earth-sized in radius planets. And so that was very exciting. Um, I want to mention, however, that these planets were not confirmed in the traditional way that you might be thinking. We did not do Doppler follow-up to get the masses of these planets. So we don't know their densities. We know their radius. Well, so how do they? How do we know that they are bona fide planets? What we did was we did follow-up observations that help us to eliminate every possible false positive scenario. You do adaptive optics imaging. You do high-resolution spectroscopy. You characterize the system both spatially and spectroscopically so that you can eliminate all of the various false positive scenarios to, to give you a very high confidence level, uh, more than 99.7% that this is an actual, that the planet interpretation is the most likely interpretation um, at that confidence level, 99.7%. Um, so that's the Kepler-20 system. And then following on its heels uh, was the Kepler-22 system. Here's an artist's rendering of Kepler-22 compared to Earth. Um, so it's significantly larger, 2.38 times the radius of the Earth, uh, but at almost the same equilibrium temperature that the Earth has. So this was the first planet in the habitable zone that was confirmed um, from our sample. Uh, 289 days is the orbital period. Now, why did the artist draw it this way? Well, because he could, because we don't know anything about them. <laughs> I mean, in our own solar system, we've got the Earth, one Earth radius, and the next smallest thing is like Neptune at four Earth radii, or almost four. Can actually have a long discussion on how we <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. In our own solar system, we have nothing of comparison. Nothing between one and four, and yet those are the planets that Kepler's finding the most of, right? What is a planet that has a radius of 2.4 or 2.5 with radius? I don't know, right? A lot of people like to call these, especially reporters, like to call these super Earths. We made it a point not to call these super Earths. We made it a point to call this a mini Neptune. Because we believe, and we've got reason to believe, you'll see in a minute, that this is going to have a high volatile content, giving it a lower density. And that's why the artist colored it kind of bluish. Maybe it's got a water envelope. Maybe the Loch Ness Monster is swimming in there. I don't know. I doubt it. Our theoreticians tell us that it's going to be mostly solid water. Uh, who knows? You know, for that matter, an Earth-sized planet, if you find something like Kepler 20 E and F that's one Earth radius, does it necessarily have to be rocky? Can you have a big giant comet, you know, or orbiting in the habitable zone? We don't know. We don't know what those statistics are going to be. All right. Kepler 22b was also found by the statistical validation method, whereby you eliminate all of the false positive scenarios. All right, so we do not have a mass yet for Kepler 22b either. And in fact, if you estimate what its Doppler reflex motion is going to be, it's prohibitively small. All right, so I believe Harps North will be able to do it. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. All right, so um, at this time, the smallest radius planet for which we also have a mass is Kepler 10b. Okay, so here's an artist's rendering of Kepler 10b uh, displayed relative to the Earth. It's about 40% larger than our own Earth, and it's orbiting in a normal period of 0.89 days. That's why we have a mass for it, right? The reflex motion is just at the hairy edge of what we're capable of doing. Um, the amplitude of that, uh, that velocity is about 3.3 meters per second. And so if you get, if you combine 
the photometry, which gives us the radius of the planet, with the mass from the Doppler spectroscopy, you get the density. Moreover, we had astroseismology data on the star itself, Kepler 10. The photometry is so precise that we can see indications of the acoustic waves propagating throughout the star in the brightness measurements. And from those, we can get the stellar properties with an accuracy of 2 to 5 percent. And the better you know the star, the better you know the planet. And that means that the error bars on the planet properties are so small that there is not any theoretical model consistent with that data to 3 sigma that is not one of a rocky kind of mercury composition uh, planet. Right? And so that's how we know that it is a rocky planet. Okay, um, let me make mention of another group, um, and there are some familiar names here, Kepler 10, 22, 21, 36. We've got a couple more that we've added, uh, just to emphasize the astroseismology theme. Here is a power spectrum on the right-hand side of our sun, showing these acoustic modes in the brightness variations, right? The, the P mode pulsations that are characteristic uh, in this power spectrum. And you can contrast that with Kepler data of some of our brighter G-type stars on the left. I think Hans Kelsen gave a talk here, maybe not so long ago. Yes, okay, good. Um, so we are able to do this not just with one or two, but literally with hundreds of stars. In fact, I would argue that astroseismology could very well be Kepler's greatest legacy. Uh, what we are learning about the stars themselves, because of the high precision geometry, is, is beautiful. Um, but combining that with planet detection is, is especially powerful. And so here we've got a montage of various power spectra that range from the lowest density stars in the upper left-hand corner down to the highest density stars. The amplitude of the pulsations decreases as you go to higher density and increases in frequency, making them ever more difficult to detect. Um, and so here, let's revert back to an HR diagram with the evolutionary tracks. Um, the red points on this diagram are planet candidate hosting stars that are bright enough for astroseismology. And so you see that many of them are at the higher temperatures they're all kind of G-type, um, but many of them are starting to evolve off of the main sequence. Those are, the, those are easier to find. Um, easier, the, the pulsations are easier to measure. Um, but as we collect more data, we're going to work our way down the right-hand side of this diagram. And uh, we're now in a position, after collecting data for a couple of years, we're in a position to be able to measure the acoustic waves on uh, the P modes on uh, kind of an early G type star. So that should be coming out pretty soon. Um, so there are catalogs of um, hundreds of stars that have astroseismology and fundamental properties, many of them planned there. Uh, let's see, Kepler has done something really significant over the last, I guess it was a year ago that we did this, um, and that was to show that George Lucas was right. <laughs> this was uh, worthy of one of George Lucas's crew coming out for the press event. That was exciting. Um, and the point being that planets orbit binary stars in circumbinary orbits, not just orbiting one of the stars in a widely separated binary, but orbiting both of the stars uh, in a circumbinary orbit. Uh, you know, I showed you some statistics on the occurrence rates of, of planets as a function of radius, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say that we have not taken binarity into account in doing those statistics. And that's a big omission, right? Half of the point sources we see up in the sky on that footprint are going to be multiple star systems. Uh, so that's something that we have to think more carefully about. Now, barring that, we've also got to worry about whether or not uh, those systems have planets. And the, the reality is, we don't know. We, we barely have a handle on binary star statistics, uh, let alone triple stars and quadruple stars. 
Oftentimes, when you have a binary, it's also got a triple, it's also got a third or fourth companion. So we don't know too much about them, what those statistics are going to be, especially at long working periods. Uh, luckily, Kepler is able to detect transiting planets, and that means it's also able to detect eclipsing binaries. So the Kepler data itself is informing us about the frequency of the eclipsing binaries, which are our most common false positives. So it's all cyclical, and we're deriving the same information um, in this way. It's been very powerful. Um, I wanted to mention, just I just want to show you the data, because you know, detecting planets in binary systems is no easy task. It's not, you don't get a nice dimming of light that occurs at exactly the same period or time, you know, with exactly the right depth and all of that. It's, it's very complicated. Because what that transit is going to look like depends on, first of all, which star it happens to be transiting, right? That's obvious. Uh, but it also depends on which direction the star is moving compared to the planet, right? If the planet and the star are moving together, the duration of the transit is going to be very long. But if they're moving in opposite directions, when that star comes around the back side, then the duration is going to be very short. So it's very difficult to design a signal detection tool to detect something that doesn't occur when you really think it's going to occur and always looks different. Right? So these things have mostly been identified by um, manual processes combing through the data on eclipsing binaries to find them. Um, we're just now getting to a point where we actually have a signal processing tool that can find these more or less broadly. Um, so you're going to see a lot more of these appear in the literature soon. Um, and I should mention one that appeared on the preprint server just a, about a week ago um, at the DPS meeting. There is a citizen science website called planethunters.org that hosts the Kepler data. And so normal citizens, the layperson, can go onto this site and inspect the data and answer a few simple questions and that leads to the identification of interesting things that our pipeline missed. And so they've identified a, a handful of new planet candidates this way. Um, but they also identified a planet in a circumbinary configuration in a quadruple system. So orbiting another pair of, of binary stars. So one planet orbiting this pair, and those two eclipsers are going around each other. So we're finding very interesting. Just wanted to mention that. And finally, um, There is a large number of stars that collectively uh, describe the most common type of planet confirmation that we have so far. And it's not by the statistical validation method that I told you about. It's not by Doppler spectroscopy to get the masses. Uh, it's through a technique called transit timing variations. And so the poster child for this one is Kepler 11. Here's our artist's conception of Kepler 11. It has six transiting planets associated with it. You have to be able to tease those all out of the data and understand the periodicities. And this, when the depths, you know, many of these planets have about the same size. So it's a mishmash of transits, and we have to be able to sort them all out and get the orbital periods exactly right. Um, but what's really interesting about this um, is represented there in the right-hand column. So on the left-hand column, you see the face folded transits, right? And I might, I'd love to show this. Um, perhaps everybody's already heard about Kepler 11, but I just love to emphasize uh, that this is a great thing to show in a trajectory physics class, or maybe an upper division physics class, because you're seeing Keplerian motion here, right? Expressed in the duration of the transit. As you go from the innermost planet to the outermost planet, the durations increase simply because of Keplerian motion, right? The orbital velocities are decreasing. At the same time, on the left-hand side, what's being demonstrated is the non-Keplerian behavior. 
the dynamical uh, information that is indicative of energy exchange between the planets themselves, or the uh, indication of a shifting barycenter, you know, the star actually moving position and therefore changing the exact transit time. So what's being plotted on the right-hand column is it's an O minus C diagram. It's the observed arrival time of the transit minus when you expected it to arrive based on a, a, just an average single period, right? And so if it were perfectly periodic, you'd have a horizontal plot line around zero, uh, but it's not. It's not perfectly, perfectly periodic. And so you have variations about zero that are statistically significant. Uh, moreover, the variations of successive planets are anti-correlated, as you can see, going in successive plots. And so this is dynamical information that we have at hand from the Kepler data alone, without the need to go to the Keck 10-meter telescope and, and do extensive observations. From the Kepler data alone, we've got dynamical information. When you have dynamically packed systems, the exchanging energy from which you can get the masses. Okay? And so the masses of uh, five of the planets has, was determined this way. Since then, more data has been collected, and now the mass of the sixth planet is, has been determined as well. We have a catalog of literally hundreds of planet candidates that show indication of a transit timing variation. This method methodology has become so important that we are actually be, becoming hopeful that we might one day see the mass determination of an Earth-sized planet in the Hubble zone through the transit timing technique. So this is something that we're very excited about. And, and just to emphasize that point, uh, I've just made that planet counter go up from 78 to 105 uh, because of the two papers that came out over the last month, I think it was, one of them was just accepted, uh, publishing collectively 40 new planet confirmations via the transit timing technique, all right? And there's a cartoon that shows some of them. There's two of these things. Uh, lots and lots of planets. All the green ones are now confirmed. Whoops. Um, but what I want to mention here is that um, many of these are very small. 1.4 Earth radii, uh, 1.5, uh, 1.1 Earth radius. Okay, confirmed with a period of 12 days around a star that's almost 16th magnitude. You know, people told us before Kepler launched, well, you know, Kepler, you know, yeah, okay, but there, these stars are so faint, you're never going to be able to confirm and characterize these planets. But here we're doing it with transit timing vari variations around stars that are 16th magnitude. So we're, we're learning a lot. All right, so um, just to conclude, I've already said, hearkening back to this diagram, um, that we're pushing down towards that bottom right-hand corner. And not only that, we were just awarded a four-year mission extension. So that will give us even better precision, smaller planets, even at longer orbital periods. The plan of attack, the strategy here, is to keep staring at exactly the same stars you know, sometimes I get asked, why don't you move the telescope and point someplace else? Maybe you'll find something interesting. Yeah, it's true, but we'd probably find more of the same. Um, so, so the idea is to keep staring at exactly the same stars. Uh, we see that many of these systems are coplanar, very highly coplanar, so we expect there to be more planets out there uh, in these systems that already have planets. And so... Uh, we're working towards that bottom, bottom right hand uh, side of the diagram where Earth resides. Um, again, so that we can determine the date of Earth. This is a mass radius diagram of planets, not stars. And it's in a very interesting region of parameter space. Down here in our own solar system is where we have Venus and Earth. Up here in our own solar system is where we have Uranus and Neptune. And we have nothing in between. And so we're now populating this part of the parameter space 
with many conformations of both radius and mass, many of these from transit timing variations. Here's Kepler 10b from Doppler, from the Doppler method. Um, Kepler 11, the green ones are the six Kepler 11 planets. And what we're learning from this, I mean, ideally what I want is to compute not just eta Earth size, eta is the, the Greek letter that we use for the frequency of planets or the occurrence rate. We want not just eta Earth size, uh, we want eta Earth size in the habitable zone. And more than that, what we really want is eta Earth size, uh, I'm sorry, eta rocky in the habitable zone, all right? Because there could very well be a distinction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, if you look at any given radius on this diagram and you make a horizontal cut, you work your way through many different theoretical isoforms or isodensity curves or isocomposition curves. Uh, so you can have planets of the same exact radius measured by Kepler that have radically different compositions. So in order to really understand what Ada Rocky is, we're going to have to know something about the density distribution. And you're only going to do that if you can get the masses. So I put that here in my kind of looking forward uh, diagram. I'm made hopeful by results like the one we saw last week, which is not Kepler's result. It's the one piece of science I had to include because it's so cool that it's not ours. Um, and this is the ESO, uh, the ESO measurement of uh, the reflex motion due to the planet, the Earth-sized planet, in a three-day orbit around Alpha Sen B, the K-type star, uh, with a reflex motion that's just some tenths of a meter per second. There were many different novel techniques that had to be employed to tease this signal out of the data. We, we have, you're competing with the signal of the star itself, right? You have to be able to tease all of those different signals out of the data. And a lot of people are skeptical of this type of thing. Um, but in actuality, it's, it's exactly what we do with Kepler. When you have various signals occurring on different time scales, they are distinguishable in frequency space. You can design filters to, to tease them apart. And, and when I read this paper um, on Alpha Sen B, little b, it, it, it reminds me of what we do with Kepler. So I, I think that this is great, um, and I'm very hopeful that we will see uh, instrumentation in the future that will push us down to the centimeter per second precision level combined with these novel techniques to disentangle the various signals so that we can get Doppler determinations of mass for the small planets. All right. Jump a little bit ahead. Oh, I have to end this in cool pictures. Let's go back to the transit of Venus. It was so beautiful. Um, this was the uh, Hanoi image, I believe, of the transit of Venus. Do you see the tiny yellow haze around the planet? That's the atmosphere, right? It's got a scale height of like five kilometers. It's really tiny. So fragile, so tiny. You can see it, but just barely. Um, the total area, if you just naively, like I did, take five kilometers and compute the area of an annulus and compare it to the planet itself, I think it's like one two hundredth of the total occulting area, right? Uh, but let's put that into perspective, right? The transit of Venus itself is about a one part per 10,000 change of brightness, and this is one two hundredth of that. Right? The atmospheric signal is going to be ridiculously small for trans transmission spectroscopy. We do not currently have the technology to do it, um, but I'm very hopeful that we will. Uh, because what we really want, looking forward, you know, let's, look, let's look forward to our grandkids, okay, maybe our great grandkids. Uh, we want to detect this. This is a microscopic picture of cyanobacteria caught in the act of metabolizing and producing that tiny little bubble of oxygen that we know and love, that, that our lives depend on. Were we to detect such oxygen in the spectrum of one of these transient planets, we would have some indication of potentially of life. 
And so this is why I said at the beginning that this is not pie in the sky, this is not science fiction. I really do believe that we're, we're getting very close. And that's, that's pretty dang exciting, you know? Uh, in the first, one of the first slides, that XKCD cartoon, uh, I didn't show you, but at the bottom, in the tiny print, it said, this is an exciting time. And if I had to change that cartoon, I probably would have added an expletive in there someplace, because it's, it's really an exciting time. So with that, I will uh, turn on the volume of my own computer, just to enjoy the beauty of the science that we're all doing, the science that humanity is, is taking on in these coming centuries. So thank you so much for having me. Before we open the floor to questions, the one thing I should mention is, of course, that Natalie is a professor in California at San Jose and also at NASA Ames, and she's leading or helping with a lot of the working groups for Kepler and their opportunities to become involved, also from the European side, in some of the topics. So, you know, we'll take her to dinner after this and we'll have a coffee at 11 o'clock tomorrow at the MPIA in case you want to talk about her guys. That's such an important point. Um, just two days ago, we released uh, four more quarters of data to the public. We, we ourselves haven't even analyzed all that. Okay, that's, uh, we've now got through quarter 13. Um, so four quarters of data, that's a year's worth of high precision photometry that's sitting there. Um, moreover, at the public archives, all of the statistical properties that we use to determine which are the good planet candidates will be publicly available. So you guys have the opportunity to go out there and find planet candidates simultaneously with us um, at the same time. We, we, we need your help, quite frankly. This is a tidal wave of data, and we can't do it with the uh, five or so people in the past a little bit more than that, but uh, that's about the order of magnitude of it. So. Uh, we're excited to have everybody take a look at that data and to participate in our working groups. Um, they will be listed on the Kepler um, website probably in a week or so, and the instructions for how to get involved will be up there too. So take a look and let us know if you can help. And I think with that, we'll open the floor for any questions you guys want to and as Kay said before, we have people first. No, 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 no pressure. Um, <laughs> other people who are young at heart are also young. Thank you. 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 Uh, we have the what? The density? Not for Kepler 22B. Oh, okay, okay. Not for mm -hmm. And now, I'm, no, we don't. Perhaps Harps and North will get it. I'm hoping that that's one of their targets. Okay. And the second one is really a great question. It's about these some moons. So, did you consider that maybe you can have Earth sized plants with an exome moon, like really yeah, big absolutely. moon, and it might be very. Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. I always get asked that question, I think, because everybody's seen the movie Avatar. <laughs> um, you know, we've got a lot of, we've got something like 50 uh, ha planets in the habitable zone that are of some size, I can't remember exactly, but, but many of the planets we have in the habitable zone right now are, are uh, giant planets, Neptunes and larger. Um, and those are going to be the ones that people are going to be scrutinizing for signature of an exomoon. Uh, because, of course, we all know that we've lived on Pandora, right? So, <laughs> yeah, that's um, so but, but again, just like the circle binary planets, it's going to require a different de detection technique. It's not strictly periodic, and it has all the same issues that circle binary planets has. Uh, probably even more extreme. But it is technically possible to see it in the data um, if the moon is you know, not the size of uh, maybe Mercury or larger. Because it would change the transit timing variation, right? You, yeah, there might also be some some uh, timing variation that would tip you off. That's right. Okay. Um, you mentioned the Galaxy Launch is the Dark website. 
uh, where you publish the data. And um, I know this uh, is a little bit, I think it's a very good way to publish data, but I wonder if it's possible to access data with own calls uh, to run uh, software on your machines somehow. Uh, yeah. Can you please comment on any virtual observatory approach to see if that any... Uh, uh, if, I, if our code is publicly available, do we have the data? To download. Where to download? To really to access? Like, all of the data is publicly available, both the pixel data and the, the fluxes that are derived from that pixel data. In fact, the fluxes are picked off at various stages in the pipeline, computed in different ways. You've got the raw flux, you've got the detrended flux, you've got the, the wavelet, you know, corrected flux that we use to detect, to detect the transits. Um, they're all archived um, in a FITS format, standard format. Um, in addition to that, the pixel data themselves are also archived, so you can start from square one if you like. And those are available at the, uh, uh, the multi-mission archive for Space Telescope, at Space Telescope uh, Science Institute, so the acronym is MAST. Uh, so they are responsible for archiving a lot of the data from many different NASA missions, and Kepler is one of them. So you just, anybody can get it? It's all there. Uh. My first question is uh, how the field of view is uh, chosen. How is the field of view chosen? Uh, okay. Second is uh, you want to search for life or the follow-up observations. <coughs> what would the follow-up observations be to find signatures of life? Um, so the Kepler field of view was chosen. Um, First, with just simple logistical things, you know, we the, the telescopes we were going to use for our follow-up observations are in the northern hemisphere, you know, CAC and the like, so we wanted something in the northern hemisphere. Uh, we are orbiting the sun, staring at one field of view continuously. So at a certain point in time, our telescope is going to be observing over the sun. And so there's an avoidance angle. You can't get too close to the sun or you're going to have a lot of scattered light into your telescope. So it was there or larger, right? So there's an avoidance angle. Um, and we wanted a large number of stars. And where you have a large number of stars is in the galactic plane. So, so those three considerations alone actually zero in on the very specific part of the sky around the Cygnus, okay? Um, now, after we kind of localized in that way, we did stellar populations simulations to optimize the galactic latitude. Because we don't want to observe the skyline of San Francisco, you know, all those bright skyscrapers or all the distant giants. We don't, we don't care about those. We want to see the fireflies that are close to us. And so we found that it was to our advantage to observe a little bit off the galactic plane. The skyline drops out of view, but you still have the fireflies. Um, so, so all of those things combined um, gave us the exact location of the field. Um, what observations are you going to do to, do to detect life? I would argue it's going to be transmission spectroscopy. You're going to take a spectrum of the star when the planet is not transiting, you're going to take a spectrum of the star when the planet is transiting, and you're going to take the subtraction of the two, and you're going to look for features. Um, and that's the great value of these transiting systems. You can find them, you know? So, so there's a mission on the books right now um, being proposed called TESS in the United States. Uh, it's a medium class mission. And, and its job would be to find the closest stars harboring transiting planets. And those are going to be very valuable for missions like JWST in the future. And, and future. TPF, you like missions, you know. Sorry. When you discuss the, uh, the false positives, I expect you might mention uh, white dwarfs, because they have the right size. Uh, so, do you find any white dwarfs? There are white dwarfs in the field of view, but since we care. Oh, um, I'm no, sorry. I mean, Transiting white dwarfs, yeah. that's the companion. Yes, there are many. And they have a very characteristic um, look about them in the, in the data. Uh, KOI 54, 
is one of them. I think 71 was another. There are many that are known, and their densities have been calculated, and that's another great area of science, yeah. And they, they puzzled us at first. Um, you know, they, they looked very different, and uh, we, we didn't know, we kind of scratched our heads, we didn't know exactly what they were. They're very square, uh, because the companion star was so much bigger than the white dwarf itself. Um, and men had these weird characteristics. I think there was a secondary that we saw as well. You can see the secondary. But the secondary was even deeper because the white dwarf is so, has such a high temperature. Very odd light curve. But we finally all got sorted out, and, and there have been a, new, a number of them that have been published in the literature, but they don't come back. That's so fun. How do you have the distances to the candidate cells? Um, it varies, of course, but um, the cone that uh, we are observing this kind of slice in the Milky Way galaxy goes out to about 3,000 uh, parsecs. I'm just giving light years because of the public. <laughs> about 1,000 parsecs. Yeah, a little bit closer. So they get the uh, hepatos parallaxes or something? Do they have parallaxes? Um, not typically, no. Uh, only the closest stars, some hundreds. Um, but you would expect doing high precision photometry for four years, or okay. seven years, that you'd be able to get the parallaxes of many of them. Um, and so the, there is there have been a couple of people that have been funded to take a look at that, and that's not yet yielded any fruit, yes. but, but it's possible. Because you need some really parameters for the stars before like, uh, evaluating the stars as a, as a candidate. And you need, the you need the star properties in order to get the planet properties. Yes, absolutely. And if you don't have the distance? Uh, well, so what we do is we take the surface gravity and the effective temperature that we get from the spectroscopy or the, or the photometry, the multicolor photometry, and we, um, and, and metallicity. Metallicity is a confounding issue. But you can take the surface gravity and the effective temperature and you can interpolate in the isochrones uh, the evolutionary tracks for an associated mass and radius, and that gives us our first estimate. And that's going to be good to like 20 percent, maybe even 50 percent. We don't expect that to be very good, but it gives us some idea so that we could pick the target stars and so we could know something about the planet properties. Once we do that, though, we've got the follow-up observation campaign with the Keck 10-meter telescope, not to do high-precision Doppler, but to do stellar classification. That's what we're finding has a much higher chaos because then we get the star properties more accurately and you get the planet properties more accurately. So that's our plan of attack. Okay. Strategy. okay uh, I'm just going to do, uh, let's do one, two, three, four, five, and then everybody can go and then anybody who has any more questions come back around. Who are the kids, who are the kids here for extra credit? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I was actually wondering if the stability of some of the market. Uh, how are the multiple systems that have been detected in so far? Do they, do they have at least one giant planet in the system? Uh, in the multis? Yeah. No, 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 they don't. Um, if you go back to, I don't know if I can find it, uh, yes, I can. Let's see. In this diagram, if I hit the animate key and you see this thing scroll up, you're going to notice that there's hardly ever any giant planets in here. These are all multiple systems, and the giant planets tend to be outside. Okay? So it's kind of like our solar system, right? Except that these are orbital periods going out to like Mercury's orbit. Okay, so it's still something very different. Um, so, but many of these systems have no giant planets, right? Lots of them. When they do have inner giant planets, like this one, you know, still you have one that's smaller on the inside. You don't have anything this big that is this first one in this first row. So, but yet we find a lot of hot Jupiters. We do find a lot of um, short period Jupiter-sized planets, but when we do, there aren't any other planets in the system. Okay. Okay, we'll You, you mentioned that you haven't found the multiple systems in the Jupiter region. So, uh, 
Have Jupiter's in multi systems, yeah. we don't find. That's okay. This could be due to uh, theoretical reasons, but uh, this will also due to observational bias. Could, could the fact that we don't see any hot Jupiters in multiples be due to an observational bias? So there was a paper um, released this year, I think it was called uh, uh, Lonely, uh, Short Period Giants or Lonely or something like that. Um, and what the author did was he scrutinized the data uh, very carefully to make sure that in these systems that had a hot Jupiter, there weren't any other planets there that were transiting and we just didn't pick them up, or some indication of a transit timing variation that indicates there might be something there that maybe is not coplanar. You know, it could be some dynamical process that scatters the lower mass planets but doesn't eject them completely. Maybe they're not transiting. So maybe you have a large dispersion of inclination angles of the orbits. Um, but he looked at, scrutinized the light curves looking for some indication of other planets in the system and found none. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose there could still be an observation bias, but it's not, I can't think of it. <laughs> So, uh, what is the distribution of the periods of the habitable zone for the, oh, sorry. the samples that I mean, the old ones? The dis I'm sorry, the distribution so, of periods for the, for oh, the, the ones that are currently in the habitable zone? No, well, no, so for the, so, so for the samples left at the start, the more or less of the mass of the mass. So, so you know what the how 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 oh, what yeah, the yeah. period of happens or happens to the zone is. Sure. So, uh, what's the statistical distribution of that? So, well, eighty percent of the stars or more that we're observing are G-type stars, and so the habitable zone is going to be out at three hundred days, you know, the center of the habitable zone. So that gives you a rough idea. We've got some stars, a small number of stars that are hotter than them, and about three thousand or so M-type stars, you know, late K, early M's. Where the habitable zone is significantly closer in, uh, but the majority of the stars are G types. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we have the observation you know, method of peppers, as I said, you just you look for a dip in brightness and you check for like, like if it has certain periods and it comes again and again and get the data and look for it. But what happens if you have a system where we don't have like, like a high density or we're not? All plants in the same frame. This can have a bias for like high eccentricity or what was the second one? Huh? So if you have high eccentricity or um, if the plants are not all in the same plane, like if you have like yeah, 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 exactly. If they're not all in the same plane, we're not going to find them. Right? Simple. So you know these mul uh, these singles where you see only one planet. I suppose there could be others that are just not transiting. Certainly. Um, but uh, if there's eccentricity. And then we wouldn't know that. So um, now, if there's eccentricity, you can't tell simply because what you see is the one transit comes around. You see another transit. You always see the transit at the same place, right? Now, if it's something extreme, maybe you'll see some difference between the ingress and the the, the egress, maybe they'll have slightly different shapes, um, but there are other ways, you know, we, if we if you have a Doppler signature, then you can get the eccentricity, of course, because you have that asymmetry. If you have transit timing variations, the dynamical content that's in that data also gives you eccentricity if you have the transit ratio. Um, and there, there are a few other novel things that are coming up, too. Um, you know, you can look for planets that cross spots on the star, and you can get information, uh, I guess not necessarily about eccentricity, more about the obliquity. Um, so, yeah, it's, when we do the modeling of our light curves for the catalog, we assume zero eccentricity. Okay, and last question? Um, can you go back to the, the last simulation that was shown the The last, the very yeah. last one? Yes. 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 So two of the, the inner two um, planets come very, very close together. Has someone estimated how long they could survive in this stage? Uh, the Kepler, yeah. So um, they've done dynamical simulations for all of the multiple planet systems. 
and almost all of them are stable to some, I mean, they, they integrate out to some acceptably long age. I don't remember exactly what that age is, um, but it's probably some hundreds of millions of years. I don't think it's a billion. But, but it's a long age, and there are almost all of them, there are very few exceptions, almost all of them are dynamically stable, including Kepler 11. Okay, they are very close to the stars. So well, I mean, I think that the uh, sizes of the planets are not no. properly scaled with the orbital distance in this animation, so it's probably good. No, no, no. That's not close to the Listen, there seems to be a trend in nature that these planetary systems are dynamically packed, often dynamically yeah. packed. That is, they are as close as possible without being unstable, which is, that's kind of an observational bias, right? Well, not observational bias, it's a bias in nature, because they'd be ejected if it were any other way. So, um, but they seem to kind of halt at that distance and remain there. Um, so it's a trend that we observe, but I don't know why that is. So I think with that, if you have any questions, please come down, or if you want to join us for dinner, please come down, and let's ask the uh, uh,